Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to TBR's webinar, Connected Device Market, Embrace the Chaos, with TBR analyst Jack Narcotta. I'm Justin Surgeon, and I'm hosting today's session. The fluidity of the Internet of Things and connected device markets creates tremendous opportunities for vendors, but the rapid pace of change risks negating vendors' attempts to capitalize on short-term opportunities instead of building their long-term strategies. A winning strategy focuses on understanding the drivers behind changing customer behaviors in device use cases and incorporates understanding of services and software to perform a value proposition for consumer and commercial connected devices. Insights from our webinar today are from our Devices and Platforms, platforms Benchmark. If you'd like to learn more about this report, please reach out to Jack or myself after the presentation. Before we begin, there are a few housekeeping items I'd like to cover. First, we'll be recording today's session and posting it on our YouTube channel, TBRI channel. We encourage you to visit our channel to watch this presentation or any of the others we've posted. Second, we'd like to hear your thoughts and opinions on what we're presenting today. Please send any of your questions to the Q&A function. We will address as many as we can at the end of the webinar. And finally, we will be following up with all of you within 24 hours of the conclusion of the webinar with the slides from the presentation as well as that previously mentioned link to the recording. Our slides will also be on SlideShare at slideshare.net backslash tbr underscore market underscore insight. Now let me introduce the analyst presenting today. Jack Narcotta, IoT and Devices Analyst, is responsible for reporting on vendors such as Acer, Apple, Asus, Fujitsu, Google, HP, Lenovo, Microsoft, Samsung, Sony, and Toshiba. Jack focuses on recognizing trends and opportunities and understanding business models and competitive landscapes in the enterprise IT and consumer device markets. Jack is also the lead author of TBR's Devices and Platforms Benchmark, as well as the majority of syndicated content in the practice. And additionally, Ezra Gothal, a principal analyst in the practice will be joining us today to assist in the Q&A after the presentation. So with that, let me hand this over to Jack. All right, Justin, thanks very much, and thanks to all that are attending today. Uh, just in, in terms of the Q&A, as uh, Justin mentioned, that Ezra will be joining us on, uh, please make sure to submit your questions either directly to Justin through the chat. Uh, we will definitely make sure to get to as many as we possibly can in the time that we have today. So without any further ado, what are we talking about? What's, what's the opportunity? What is, what is all this about? Uh, the headline, you know, embrace the chaos. And it's going to be a, a very fast-growing, fast-moving, very fluid and dynamic marketplace in the devices realm over the next five years. Um, more than $70 billion in revenue by 2020. That equates, based on our forecast, to about 400 million units shipped, more than offsetting some of the flattened growth that we expect in mobile and PC markets. It, it really helps to create a new category, and I think what's more important, perhaps, is that it's creating a new category without replacing the existing devices. So it's, it's more than just the, the peripherals that go into any of the mobile device or the PC segments. It's more than accessories. It's a net new ecosystem of devices that both consumers and commercial entities will begin to adopt to embrace for commercial uh, type of deployments. They'll be putting them into systems for consumers. Systems will be built around the myriad type of devices that we will be uh, finding ourselves either in our cars, on our person, uh, or in our homes. So I think it, it, it behooves us to, to, to take a look at, at this particular market, not necessarily as any one particular product type. Uh, One-off products typically don't promote the growth or foster the long-term engagement simply because they just they fulfill a niche need. But those niche capabilities ultimately over the next five years will begin to be integrated into other devices to watches, to streaming side, uh, streaming set-side boxes like Roku and Apple TV, compute sticks, everything is going to be connected in some way, and this opportunity is kind of the sum of the total uh, connected device opportunity. So certainly a, a significant market mover as well as accelerated in the time frame in which uh, we expect it to be embraced by the industry and consumers over the next five years. So as Justin mentioned, uh, there I am and there Ezra is. Uh, we'll be more than happy to take questions throughout the uh, presentation. Just be sure, as I mentioned, to use the chat function. We will uh, take care of your questions with as much time as we have. 
So moving on, here's, here's our agenda today and the topics that we'll be discussing over our time together today. Uh, first, I think it helps to start with a definition and what does TBR include in its definition of connected devices? It's everything from wearables, uh, set side boxes like Roku, Apple TV, modules that will ultimately enable some kind of smart clothing or smart eyewear, headgear, automotive components, uh, travel or heavy industry type of sensors. Those, those types of things uh, we're, we're classifying as modules and obviously as the market evolves, uh, our definitions will become more granular as the products become more mature. Uh, this does cross over into what has typically been classified as the Internet of Things, and it is in some ways, but for the purposes of our discussion today, I think it will be more advantageous for everybody to center on the thing and not necessarily the Internet uh, component of, of IoT. We'll also be going over the impact on the total addressable market, uh, which uh, the first slide hinted at a little bit. We'll also be taking a look at what are consumers or enterprise users waiting for in terms of adoption or technology or services. We'll also be taking a look at what strategies vendors are deploying to reach into new markets or reach further into markets in which they're already playing. We'll also take a look at what's getting in the way of those strategies, what's getting in the way of widespread adoption by users and in tandem the revenue potential for vendors. We'll also take a look at what users expect. Um, we've done some additional research with end users in parallel with our benchmark that shows some very interesting trends for both consumer and commercial markets, and we'll dig into that a little bit. And then finally, we'll gauge the ways in which we believe vendors will succeed and the strategies that will ultimately help promote a winning environment, or on the flip side, what happens if vendors take a wait and see approach? In both IoT and connected devices, a common question that we get asked is where do we start? Um, what, what aspect of the market should we focus on first? And we hope our discussion today will provide some context for that answer and begin to be formed perhaps in your own organizations, in your customers' organizations, or ideally in both. So let's begin. The connected device market is prime for significant and explosive growth through 2020, particularly as demand catches up with the rapid pace of development. Uh, TBR believes this market will be a significant uh, and supplemental market for device vendors growing at nearly an 80% CAGR over the next five years, with unit shipment growth topping about 400 million in 2020, primarily driven by this successful tandem of, of future iterations of smartphones and smartwatches, not the least of which the Apple Watch and its ilk. Uh, connected devices will add to, but not replace, and this is a big factor to remember here, the established ecosystem of form factors. This is important given the state of each of the three main global markets because in smartphones, the growing prevalence of good enough devices has really robbed many vendors of the technical differentiators that have propelled growth over the last few years forcing vendors to rely on budget price devices that generate less revenue and profit. So while the market itself or the global market is continuing to expand, um, there is less growth. The, the growth curve has begun to flatten out. In tablets, the, uh, the sequential upgrades, not necessarily the innovative upgrades, have really muted customer demand and cause the tablet market to devolve into what has largely begun uh, in what has largely become a price war, particularly in Asia Pacific where large screen smartphones are overtaking compact tablets. And here I, I suppose you could make a case for the iPad rising above this, this, this particular fray, especially as Apple leverages its partnership with IBM. But for Apple, restoring growth to the iPad segment is really not a priority for it given the current success of the iPhone. So uh, that is also one of the challenges to the market as well. In PCs, leading vendors are staking their claims by competing across multiple price bands, but consumer sentiment continues to tilt toward lower priced entry level, mid-range systems that promise greater market share, albeit at the expense of profits for some, HP's Stream PC 
is an example of this. It's been a market winner largely in the, leader, uh, in the battle against uh, PCs from Dell and Lenovo, and also helping build brand strength ahead of HP split in November. So those, those newer kinds of strategies ahead of the Windows 10 launch, which is also um, beginning to influence the market, uh, signal that there are changes afoot in the established business models, the way things have been done over the last few years. Connected devices represents a growth opportunity for all vendors in these spaces, particularly as growth in the macro global markets begins to peter out and begins to flatten over the next few years. So, and actually from a platform perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it'll be helpful to outline some of the trends that we do see influencing the market. Um, the majority of smartphone growth driven by, uh, or the majority of smartphone market share driven largely by Android, I think it's important to look at Android's path through, through the market for connected devices will largely mirror their smartphone strategies. We're talking here about quick market share gains at the expense of profit that only vendors with large scale can tolerate long term. Samsung obviously is the classic business case here. Many of its products share similar specifications and components. Uh, they can build to suit or build to demand, build to the market. Other vendors like Asus or Huawei take a more scaled down approach and target specific product segments either as tie-ins to their existing mobile device strategies such as ASUS or perhaps trying to bolster or foster some new growth in some new initiatives in its consumer-facing segments such as Huawei. For connected devices, PC-centric vendors will, we believe, will position their, their devices as a data management hub for users, fitness, health trackers, music players, notification managers. The thirst for data which will increase in tandem, obviously, with the increased amount of devices, really does become an important inflection point for vendors here, as even with some data moving to the cloud, local management and ad hoc analytics, either through a localized application, especially in fitness tracking, becomes an important differentiator. So the connected device is the tool that generates data, and the PC helps, or in some cases, becomes the primary means of unlocking or extracting value from that data. So we've got all these great things happening here. So what are connected device users waiting for? And I think what they're waiting for at this stage in the market, they're waiting for leaders to emerge outside of Apple. They're waiting for strategies to become more concrete. They're waiting for go-to-market messaging to become more clear and succinct. <clears throat> They're also looking for, in tandem with these strategies, how will I use this device? When will I use it? What other tasks or services can it perform for me? Or what other tasks can it help me do outside of the thing that I bought it to do originally? And TPR uh, believes that this is important, primarily since in the early stages of connected device market growth, ASPs emerged as the primary differentiator, helping fuel uh, things like the Fitbit, Jawbone, devices that cost maybe between $50 and $100 that were not necessarily a huge barrier to purchases, but consumers were willing to make that leap and take that, that proverbial risk into trying out a new device. But now that the market is beginning to mature, the use cases are starting to emerge, the user experience of engaging with the device or uh, managing or interacting with the data it produces, that user experience is really catching up quickly as a primary differentiator. For vendors such as Apple, uh, or vendors, even leaders such as Apple, are really still continuing to seek the right mix of hardware, software, and, uh, hardware, software services, and partnerships that help create that long-term value with consumers. Uh, will it work with the devices I already have? If yes, how? If not, when? Um, if it's a question of if, the value proposition of a lot of these devices gets undermined because they typically tend to be viewed as more of like a niche or a one-off product. Finally, who are the leading vendors and how wide or narrow are their portfolios? Will companies like Jawbone be around if Fitbit is the primary company? Or will Fitbit be around if 
Jawbone or any of the other vendors that are rapidly coming into this marketplace. What new devices will emerge from, from these and other leading vendors? And these are the things that connected device users, primarily consumers at this point, but some of the hallmarks here can be applied into commercial markets. These are what they're waiting for. So in response, what are the vendor companies doing? What are the companies that we track in our benchmark beginning to do for their connected device strategies? Primarily, it involves, at this early stage, exploring new routes to market. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that vendors are reaching into their installed bases first, as those customer bases are most likely to purchase connected devices, but they're approaching it in new ways. Apex consumer markets, we think, holds some, some important keys here <clears throat> for how the consumer market will change, but it also shows new ways for vendors to begin to adapt their commercial, uh, their, their commercial device strategies um, as well. Uh, vendors such as Coolpad and Micromax uh, in China and India, respectively, um, do showcase some of the uh, newer capabilities here. And uh, Coolpad, for example, is the subsidiary of China's TCL Corporation, leans on its relationship with partners uh, or its carriers to help fuel its growth. And we estimate, based on our current benchmark, that it sells about 12 million smartphones per quarter, a pretty healthy amount. And it recently announced wearables and commercial sensors that utilize engineering and design cues from its smartphone and its telecom prowess. So that is trying to create a larger ecosystem around those types of uh, new, new types of connected devices, be it a wearable or be it some sort of industrial sensor. Micromax, on the other hand, is one of the more visible and, part, and popular smartphone retail brands in India, knows its market very well, trails only Samsung in terms of market share in that country, and in May, it created a new brand, U, or YU, um, that already sells a wearable and health tracker through Amazon's India business unit, as well as Flipkart and many other places. So what we start to see is partnerships becoming very important, uh, helping vendors fill the gaps in either their commercial or their consumer or both uh, service and device offerings. I think Samsung's acquisition of SmartThing is really a template here as its primary objective was not really SmartThing's IP or its product line, but the diverse range of customer or consumer companies that Samsung is partnered with. So, Mobile-centric companies, I think, tend to be out of the gate first with their value propositions to customers. How they approach the market ultimately provides cues to other vendors for what strengths to promote and what risks to be aware of. Uh, the wearables market, compute sticks, alternative computing devices or sensors are the prime examples here. Where the new, uh, where the new devices are extensions of the existing paradigms but ultimately represent a new set of use cases and price points. So, We've established that users are waiting for the devices. Their vendors that they're considering are beginning to formulate strategies to create opportunities across the entire market without necessarily amplifying a large degree of risk. So things are moving along. There's notable acceleration in the market. But in the short term, which is to say in the next six to 12 months, we think that there are three primary obstacles that will generate some friction here. First are niche use cases. The health trackers like Fitbit, Jawbone provide a great deal of value for some, but lack a broader appeal and are often in conflict with many of the apps that are freely available or in some cases actually built into or pre-installed on the smartphone. Uh, why, why do I need it? A, a user might ask, what else can I do with it? What value outside of counting steps would have for me if I'm not a fitness nut? And we think this largely will be the state of the market for some time but as new technology enters the market, particularly from Intel with its Curie modules and related technology from Samsung with its uh, Artec, um, A-R-T-I-K, its Artic processor platform, these cases will broaden as the underlying technology makes it easier for a single device, excuse me, a single device to perform multiple functions. And we see this curve of, of technology versus capabilities in many of the markets. Um, certainly, we've seen it in the smartphone market, to a lesser extent in the PC market, and we're in, in the connected device market, it's about to happen again. History is set to repeat itself. Second is that the technology, speaking of technology, is 
actually quite ahead of consumer demand today, even though we are as consumers and perhaps as uh, employees or professionals asking for these devices. Um, there's a, a palpable sense that users are overwhelmed with the many new devices that are coming not only from established vendors, <clears throat> but beginning to appear through other channels, even retailers such as Target and Ikea, as well as startups that promote their products through crowdfunding or through crowdsourcing or social networking. It's a very chaotic time for people to be, or users to be considering these types of devices. It's also going to be a very exciting time for vendors because it does represent a, a significant amount of opportunities, but it will also be a very challenging time. Trends will rise, they'll fade away, consumer sentiment for many types of devices or technology will reach a fever pitch and then cool off. Businesses will engage and then seek, uh, but then ultimately begin to seek more uh, implementable reference architectures and uh, perhaps uh, the dirtiest three-letter acronym out there, ROI, return on investment. So much like the smartphone revolution, uh, the growth rate will be extreme, it'll be very quick, but not quite as quickly as mobile devices, but still a significant opportunity for vendors as well as a, as, as well as a significant disruptor in the marketplace. And then finally, um, it's the lack of a killer app. Um, Ezra and I have, have talked about the, the wearables market over some time and really feel like the killer app of the Apple Watch is not so much in its product design, uh, its appeal at a certain price point, but rather in notification management. So figuring out how to make the process of getting important notifications from your phone has become not only what will help the Apple Watch, but also, um, as the saying goes, uh, a rising tide lifts all ships, will help uh, cultivate growth in the global uh, smartwatch industry for both um, Apple and Android-powered devices. But so, but, but even that killer app of notification management has yet to really drive demand that mirrors that of mobile devices. And I think it's, it's largely due to that user habits have really become ingrained after years of using smartphones as a hub of our personal and professional lives. And again, with these types of devices, without a killer app, we wind up asking ourselves, either as consumers or as professionals, what do we do with it? What do we want to do with it? Can we do what we want to do with it? So those are the, the three primary obstacles uh, that are really standing in the way, I think, at least in the short term, the next six to 12 months in the connected device marketplace. So additionally, there are some new companies that are entering and disrupting the vendor landscape. And I think the rise of many of these vendors complicates the, if not the go-to-market strategies, then some of the value propositions that the PC and mobile device companies have been discussing over the next, or excuse me, over the last few years to their addressable market. So this includes companies like Lenovo, Huawei, uh, ZTE, both inside and outside of China. These newer vendors really do have aims to expand their addressable markets outside of their home countries by taking uh, new approaches into the market as we discussed earlier. So what, what are they doing differently? And I think it speaks to the ability of companies like Coolpad and Micromax to take cues from what's going on in the consumer market in APAC, particularly in China, and begin to craft some pretty savvy go-to-market strategies to capitalize on some of the customer loyalty, their growing scale in retail, uh, heightened brand recognition to ultimately vault into leadership positions in these APAC markets. And it, I think the, the clearest example of this, specifically in the wearables market, let's take a look at a company like ShowMe. Very successful smartphone company, very successful brand, very strong brand. Consumers are clamoring for it, um, either through uh, social media or through many retail outlets. But they were able to transform that customer loyalty and, and the customer or the demand from their customer base to go from zero presence in wearables to 
the global number two in just six months, just a few hundred thousand units by our estimate behind Fitbit. So that's a template that many companies, including Lenovo, Huawei, ZTE, perhaps even Dell and HP, are looking at for how to re-engage with the consumer market. Um, these companies such as Xiaomi, Coolpad, Micromax, they're companies that are built to exploit their volume-based sales strategy, right? It becomes very easy to insert new products such as wearables or sensors or any other types of connected devices into manufacturing processes that are already producing 30, 40, or 50 million smartphones per year. But you could also, in contrast to that, say, well, many other companies are doing that as well. What's, what's different? And the common threads that are running through these companies, through the strategies that these companies are implementing, really comes down to customer loyalty, as I mentioned, uh, but also it's scale and retail, um, or their scales and retail, their proven relationships with both the technology and very strong brands. They know how to reach their customers, read their sentiments through social media or customer events, formulate go-to-market and product development strategies that accentuate that insight, and the companies actually become emboldened by it. They're, they're very aggressive, but that's not to say that they're reckless. They're selective, but they aren't weighed down by long product refresh cycles. Their entire businesses really have been built around the one or two year cycle of mobile device upgrades, and they realize the power and the value that can be unlocked, not only by acting quickly, but acting in the first place, right? This is about building the business case, allocating the resources, and then moving. Uh, being among the first here, if not the first in the market, has some significant advantages. And part of that is the attach rates that we're seeing begin to emerge as these connected devices uh, are sold either in tandem or as an add-on sale to any of the mobile devices. So Apple's watch attach rate we're estimating is around 10% compared to total iPhone sales. So what that translates to for this quarter, especially as Apple releases its earnings tomorrow, we're looking at between, say, 3 and 4 million Apple Watches sold for the roughly 30 to 40 million that were um, iPhones that we're expecting it to use. Xiaomi's attach rates for its wearables are very similar to its smartphone numbers. So this is a trend that is emerging that vendors are beginning to capitalize on. They're beginning to formulate not only the strategies to help uh, promulgate these particular types of attach rates, but sustain them, to grow them, to look for ways to engage on a broader base with why the consumers are drawn to the, de to, to the devices in the first place, making it as easy as possible for them to move into that particular segment of the market without foregoing any of the strengths in the customer base or the brand strength that they've been able to build up over the last few years. So for this part of the presentation, we're gonna steer away a bit from the consumer-oriented discussion to make sure that we don't ignore the commercial applications. Um, I don't want to give the impression that it's solely a consumer play because there will be a focus on businesses, but I do want to focus on this particular area in a way that has now largely become what is defined by the at-large industry as IoT, the Internet of Things. So connected devices begin to transition into what TBR defines as IoT particularly as the number of devices in a commercial deployment and the data they generate ultimately requires the system to reap the most benefits from it. This is what, uh, this is the inflection point, if you will, from where IoT separates from connected devices. And I, I tend to think about it that you can have connected devices in a commercial environment without calling it IoT, but you can't have IoT without connected devices. And perhaps that's probably um, an oversimplification, but that tends to uh, be a more concrete way, at least at this stage in the market, for how to define or uh, define the separation between the two. What's the DMZ between these two particular concepts? So what do commercial markets do for uh, connected devices? Um, first, I think it's important to look at that the telecom operator networks 
have the infrastructure that will link the devices and they will play a critical role, um, these operators and network providers, in condensing the number of standards from, as of April 2015, there were more than 70 standards specifically related to IoT. So condensing those numbers of standards to a more manageable and, and appealing, for, for enterprises anyway, um, to, to a more manageable number. Uh, we think this is a, a really important part of the IoT and the connected device boom, particularly as a fewer number of standards ultimately encourages interoperability, but then also begins to mandate things like security, management, um, kind of standard operating procedures that ultimately fosters widespread deployment across a wider range of industries as opposed to um, a select few in either logistics or heavy industry or building automation, something to that extent. Uh, partnerships will also be an important gauge for the viability of a commercial device's uh, connected solutions portfolio. Uh, vendors lacking the analytics or the management or the security capabilities will partner to fill the gaps in their portfolio. We, we do see indications of this in recent moves by Dell and IBM. In the case of Dell, its IoT solution focus becomes providing the data center infrastructure right up until the point of a gateway from which its partner uh, begins to deploy the actual connected device solution, which in this uh, scenario is uh, building automation for climate control, security, things like that. Um, it, it really behooves uh, commercial markets or vendors primarily engaged in commercial business generation to understand that demand in commercial markets will be slower than in consumer markets, but stay the course because those customers and service providers have always tended to be a little bit more pragmatic. So the commercial systems do allow data-centric vendors to begin to broker partnerships with consumer companies um, or initiate consumer types of applications. So it doesn't necessarily have to be fitness or clothing or wearables, but it can be a consumer uh, application wrapped up in a commercial solution. So a great example of this is some of the innovations we expect and some of the new technology to emerge from the healthcare industry, either um, patient monitoring, uh, records or information transfer. They are largely a consumer type of application in that it's benefiting or the technology is benefiting uh, the consumer's wellness or uh, how the consumer accesses or interacts with their own data. Uh, but ultimately, it's a commercial application. But the caution that we do have here um, is that few, if any, data center companies really will make a leap into consumer markets without some sort of partner. Um, there's a uh, higher degree of risk in those particular markets. So as the partnership strategies begin to focus more on brokering technology alliances that ultimately allows vendors to provide end-to-end -end solutions, Reference architectures like machine-to-machine -machine communication provide the blueprint for connected device deployments and ultimately lead commercial IT and service providers to work to develop the killer app that, as with consumer markets, um, remains somewhat elusive today. But ultimately, once they do find uh, their groove, if you will, with the killer app, that will ultimately begin to ignite, we think, the commercial connected device deployments. So let's turn our attention back now to the value of the consumer, or you could say the user. Um, TBR research into consumer connected device markets that we did earlier this year shows that users are budgeting up to purchase around $300 in the next 12 months in addition to the mobile device or PC they're already considering. So we think this is ultimately what kickstarts the connected device revenue growth. And you have to remember this is additive supplemental revenue. This is $300 on top of the smartphone or the PC or the tablet that they're looking to buy with a 10% attach rate across most of the industry appearing to hold true at this stage in the market. That's a significant revenue opportunity that not only presents opportunities to earn new customers, but begins to lay the groundwork for an ecosystem of devices and transforming that ecosystem ultimately into customer loyalty. And why is that important? Because everything 
will be connected. It's inevitable. Some, some devices are connected today. Apple is an example of this as well as Android Auto and Wear and Google's other various initiatives. But consumer expectations based on our research are showing that all devices are expected to be connected regardless of their platform. Wi-Fi, I think, here becomes a medium to which all devices and connected, um, are, are connected and, and share information. Perhaps intra-ecosystem relies on things like Bluetooth or possibly some other emerging standards between connected devices. Consumers have told us that they want their devices to help them streamline tasks to perform functions. But what the larger context of their responses was telling us was that I want a device I, the, the consumer, wants a device that provides value above the core function of the device. Does it make it easier for me to do the things that I do every day? Is the device valuable in helping me flow back and forth um, across a handful of devices, among many devices, as painlessly as possible? Does it allow me to do something new using an interface and a form factor I'm familiar with? It, it's very clear that this is really becoming about the value that users are perceiving the devices to unlock versus the device themselves. For these types of devices to become more mainstream, to become broadly adopted by consumers, the integration of these connected devices will require some, some commercial solutions. Uh, healthcare, streaming media, connected home solutions require server, storage, networking, uh, security, cloud management. I'm sure I missed a category, but they need these things to not only function properly, but to provide the following, and that's the ability to extend the value of what it means to be connected across a range of devices and services. This is the flow that I was talking about. In, in a commercial environment, it could be about flowing between computing environments. What, what kind of access can I get to uh, from the different connected devices that I have? Or what, what types of resources do I have access to based on my location or my proximity to another group of resources? Or how do I allocate services based on the type of device that I have? Is the device or the service intelligent enough to know based on the contextual data that either a sensor is uh, producing or that my device itself is producing um, can help me define and streamline or customize my computing experience. It will also require some kind of infusion of predictive analytics to optimize the behavior and enable proactivity in these types of connected device solutions, right? It's all about making it, make it simple, make it more simple than it is today. There's data to be mined from even the simplest applications, uh, tracking a task from the time it takes to complete from start to finish. And really, I think this is why most connected device solutions today, or what we call IoT, have largely uh, begun to focus on metrics-driven tasks, so building automation, supply chain management, healthcare, heavy industry. These, these solutions are addressing something that in practice is very simple but does provide incredible value that is, at times, very immediately apparent, whether it's lower operating costs, healthier patients, uh, streamlined operations, increased worker productivity across the entire enterprise. It's a, a very important aspect of the connected device solution to be able to unlock that value akin to what happens in the consumer markets. So, Another aspect is allowing the devices or using the devices to allow for automation, for greater control. Um, this is a key value of the proposition for the connected homes. Um, operators uh, or anyone from, from Verizon, Sprint, AT&T, T-Mobile, if you're on the call, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But it's not just control for control's sake. Automation itself, it, it's it's not sexy, right? It's, it's actually kind of boring in that it's roboticizing things that are done every day, but there's value in that. There's value in enabling users to customize their workflow or their life flow to their specific needs that goes across all types of devices and all types of platforms. And finally, connected devices allow vendors to monetize the data that's generated and ultimately 
will help them create new business models. There's tremendous potential here to perform the, to transform the competitive landscape as it exists now. There's going to be new vendors that perhaps three or four years ago were never thought to be direct competitors to some of our more established stalwarts that will be able to get into the market and really compete more quickly and more effectively than they have before. I'm not saying that there's a utility company that will one day give cloud service providers a run for their money, but the commercial connected device solutions that today are offered by IBM or Dell or HP or Verizon or AT&T may ultimately find themselves competing with similar services from that utility company who may have deployed a, a pragmatic and organized collection of smart home solutions or smart meter solutions that help create a supplemental revenue stream, something as simple as for a nominal fee we'll monitor the energy use in your home, creating revenue that provides much more lucrative returns from service-based revenue as opposed to energy delivery. So these are the types of changes that will be indicative of what's happening in the market, not only in commercial segments, but the type of disruption that will occur um, in consumer markets and for vendors that are really looking to engage in the connected device ecosystem. So we're coming at the close of the presentation, so I wanted to take a look at where we've gone through or what we've gone through so far, uh, just to make sure that we're all set for, for any of the, uh, um, the Q&A session. So device vendors are laying the groundwork to position themselves in emerging supplemental markets such as connected devices, which will account for nearly 74 billion in new revenue by the year 2020. Um, obviously a significant new market growth driver, not only for consumer-oriented vendors, but for vendors that are looking to perhaps get more into connected device system deployments, the analytics, the security, the, the other capabilities that go into that for any of our more data center-centric or enterprise-centric companies. A winning strategy in these new markets really anticipates changes to customers' purchasing behavior as well as the device use cases. So taking cues from some of the companies that are being very disruptive in how they're approaching the market, particularly over in APAC and specifically in, in China's consumer market, really taking advantage of some of the first mover advantages that are afforded by not necessarily resetting the go-to-market strategies, but beginning to evolve them and better align them with how consumer sentiment, how consumer purchasing and use behavior is beginning to shape the market. And uh, what, what do we think will happen here for vendors that are not invested in this ecosystem? Um, certainly, as the slide says, you can't win if you don't play, but what's at stake here? What, what are the, if not the repercussions, then some of the consequences that uh, may be indicative of uh, delaying entry or perhaps not even participating in this market at all. And I think it's a long period of decline. Um, back and forth among the Windows vendors, Apple continues to uh, work a little bit of its magic in, insofar as how it outperforms the global PC market, um, largely because of its seamless Customer experience, uh, customer experience, excuse me, across all its devices, boosting the appeal of its PCs and its mobile devices. Um, a smaller base of customers actually helps shield Apple a little bit to a degree from the, from the effect of declining demand for Windows PCs, thus helping it perform the, uh, or helping it outperform the global market. But um, there are some challenges uh, that the PC industry certainly will be facing over the next couple of years, even as uh, PC revenue contraction, primarily caused by what we see as falling ASPs, um, is offset to some degree by the resurgent operating system helping PCs evolve, right? Um, Windows 10 is going to help become the entertainment and the productivity hub um, for many users. The PC continues to be uh, based on our own end user customer research, really remains the center of how users are flowing from device to device depending on the tasks they're performing. Um, because the flow 
computing experience allows consumers to choose the device they need in the moment. The PC does remain at the center. Um, the the do-it-all capabilities does place the PC at the center of this ecosystem, but the hardware market for these Windows OEMs are finding it very challenging to, re to, to reignite growth ahead of the launch of Windows 10 later this month even. And for Chrome, well, the vast majority of the Chrome ecosystem is populated with consumer Chromebooks. The Chrome ecosystem continues to diversify, vendors embracing new form factors such as set side boxes, uh, the Chrome box, compute sticks. Um, of the three platforms, TBR does believe that Chrome is well positioned as a connected device um, innovator as its wide range of services and Google's risk-friendly R&D do allow it and its OEMs to introduce new form factors and spark use cases, but the opportunity at this stage is small as uh, Chrome, while growing, is coming from a smaller revenue base. In mobile devices, um, APAC represents the largest growth opportunity for Apple, particularly in China, as its consumers are drawn to the Apple brand, the innovative features of the larger iPhone 6 Plus, readily available through China Unicom, China Mobile. But what we're seeing with the Android um, ecosystem is that the challengers to Samsung's crown, particularly China's Xiaomi, are gaining at uh, Samsung's expense with uh, sub $150 devices that ultimately impact and um, in some regions of the world exaggerate revenue decline even as global unit shipments of, Androids can, um, of Android smartphones continue to climb. So it's becoming a little bit of a race to the bottom particularly as the devices by and large are good enough across the entire price range, not with some of the most used features and capabilities, not just limited to the premium devices. For Windows Phone, feature phones accounted for 74% of the 33 million handsets that Microsoft shipped in 1Q15, so that ratio is completely out of sync with the other mobile vendors and really indicative of some of Microsoft's struggles to transition its legacy Nokia customers to Lumia's. Microsoft's recent announcement does accelerate its, its retreat from the consumer market, and we believe ultimately an evolution into what we think will become a new play for a quote unquote business phone. Um, Satya Nadella's largely hardware agnostic long-term strategy does make Windows a play in this particular market. Um, thus allowing Microsoft to keep alive its significant in the former Nokia brand, but with um, the retreat from the consumer market, that does complicate that strategy um, to a certain degree. So as you can see, without capitalizing and moving into this emerging opportunity in connected devices, there is a degree of risk. You may gain market share, um, albeit at the expense of some of the second or third tier vendors, but largely the PC and mobile device markets are expected to, uh, to flatline a little bit over the next few years, thus highlighting the tremendous opportunity for vendors to begin to engage with the connected device ecosystem and generate more opportunities to not only interact and engage with, with consumers and commercial entities, uh, but also begin to accelerate their revenue and profit generation activities. And with that, uh, Justin, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over for our first couple questions and any other housekeeping items that you have. All right, excellent. So yeah, we've got a lot of questions here, so we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, first question, you've suggested there's no commercial IoT without a large number of connected devices connected to a hub in a commercial setting. How many incremental PC sales will be generated, generated by the rise of commercial IoT? So I think it's, it's not so much that commercial IoT requires a, a large number of connected devices. I think it's more that the commercial or what will become the classic uh, commercial IoT deployment will require devices that are uh, connected in a system. And I think it's, it's the, for, for commercial IoT deployments, I think in contrast to what happens in the consumer market where the thing in IoT is, at least for now, the focus, the internet or the system that connects the devices in a commercial deployment will be intrinsically more, more of a focus for 
those particular types of deployments, but the connected device itself, whether it's a sensor, um, something that's installed in a building, in an office on a campus, or something that's worn, um, you know, you could have a worker in an oil refinery or any, uh, some sort of logistics facility. Those types of devices will be important, but above those particular devices, uh, the sensors and other components um, play a secondary role to the system. As for it um, inspiring or catalyzing any of the PC sales, um, I, I'm not sure that the two are necessarily related although the data that is produced by these devices may uh, ignite some demand for applications that are installed on some of the other connected devices that we have. So PCs, smartphones, and tablets that are powered either by Windows or by Android that use enterprise applications to mine, analyze, manage, or otherwise move the data to interact with the data that these, de that these devices are producing. I think that's probably the, the larger play for PCs in a connected uh, or in a commercial IoT type of deployment. All right, uh, next question. If watches are at a 10% attach rate, what is the next most item on the list of connected devices from an attach rate perspective? So this is where it starts to get um, interesting and very granular. So watches for consumer-oriented companies or wearables uh, represent certainly uh, the most um, immediate, uh, the proverbial low-hanging fruit. Um, where we get into the secondary product categories are uh, things like heads-up displays. So that could be, um, in particular, with the advancements that Intel and Samsung are bringing to the marketplace later this year. It's wearables for uh, glasses, for sport applications, ski goggles, for clothing, for things that you put, not just the sensor that might be underneath the sole of your foot, but perhaps a line of clothing, a line of sneakers or shoes that have the devices integrated into them. It's um, the second largest category after wearables or smartwatches will be the modules that are inserted into the various types of uh, clothing or um, other types of applications. Um, so I think the other product categories that we're looking at very strongly are things like glasses, headwear, footwear, clothing, um, as well as any other components that might be mounted onto sensors that interact with any number or um, a related ecosystem of these particular devices. All right, uh, next question. Will the need in predictive analytics give IT vendors more opportunities in disrupting into the, fu into the future networked device market compared to the existing device manufacturers? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's one, one of the phrases I've, I've come to coin over the last couple days is that data, data equals dollars. These devices are going to be producing it, reams of data that are um, for vendors that are looking for, or vendors that are capable of either through their own organic analytics initiatives or through any kind of partnerships. There is, there are trends and uh, situations, scenarios that will help, uh, that these data sets will outline that with the proper use of analytics, commercial vendors can begin to um, f formulate strategies for how to help a business monetize that data. Can you make your workers more efficient? Can you make uh, the operations, your day-to-day -day operations more efficient by using data analytics? Absolutely. What happens if it points into a new direction that says you've largely been a hardware vendor, a manufacturer, a distributor of products and equipment, Perhaps there's a service opportunity. Perhaps there's new revenue streams or new business units that can be created simply by taking a look at how the business goes about and having more insight into how a business operates on a day-to-day -day basis. All right. Uh, can you give some examples of how people use connected devices across uh, all platforms to optimize their life? 
So I think it speaks to using a application on a smartphone to conduct an internet search that would then be completed uh, via web browser usually, or that could be uh, continued uh, to a PC or a tablet, um, viewing a, a movie or um, some sort of other entertainment, whether it's music, um, either from cloud storage or from some, some, more, some sort of other streaming service, being able to move that content through Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or what have you from mobile device to PC to perhaps to replicate it from one device to many if it's on a home and on a trusted network. Um, moving those types of, moving that type of content around is also an indication that you can move the experience around from mobile device to PC to connected television to uh, any range of products um, that may be in the commercial aspect. and. Uh, excuse me, on the consumers, on the, on the consumer aspect, but also it does speak to some of the capabilities for these types of connected devices to begin to optimize the workflow on a, uh, for a professional in a commercial environment as well. All right, uh, next question. Do you see, really see Chrome on the PC market? I think the bigger question is Windows, Google, or iOS for the new market. Do we see Chrome on the PC market? Well, they're definitely showing up. Um, several million units of Chromebooks shipped across Acer, Asus, Samsung, uh, various other vendors such as to uh, Toshiba, Fujitsu, HP. Um, it, it's not necessarily a direct replacement for PCs, although for some users it is a direct replacement of a PC, especially if they live in the browser all day long and use Google services as their primary means of communication and entertainment and information gathering. Um, but by and large, it's, it's a platform that is, while, it, while it, it is in competition with things like OS X and Windows, um, it does uh, speak to the need to have an operating system that is built to uh, meet the demands of what users are trying to do with it. Um, if they're on a uh, web-based platform where they're interacting with uh, primarily Gmail and then using the web to surf around either for entertainment or for information or for both, then it emerges as a PC-like platform in that, in that it is a personal computer. It is a personal computing device uh, that does meet those requirements and then um, does complicate some of the uh, some of the value proposition of uh, certainly some of the, the entry-level full-blown Windows PCs but by and large, from what we see, that consumer sentiment for the Chromebook and the Chrome operating system in general is it fills a need as a secondary or as a tertiary device, by and large, for most users. So while it is a PC, I think the context of your question is more that it's not necessarily a direct competitor to Windows as it is a direct competitor for some of the things that Windows has typically done over the last few years. All right, we've got time for one last question here. Sure. Uh, can Chrome become a basis for commercial IoT? Can Chrome become a basis of commercial IoT? Yes, but I think in a limited capacity compared to what Android, what the potential for Android is in that environment. I know there's been much talk, much rumor, speculation about the two operating systems, Android and Chrome, coming together, especially now that they're managed under one executive and one development team at Google. And I think the Chrome value proposition is more about providing a streamlined con computing experience through the browser where it's cousin Android is truly an operating system that powers devices, um, allows developers to build applications, real applications for it, not just extensions, although perhaps there may be some applications for, um, I'm thinking on my feet here, is that a 
I think a solid application for Chrome in commercial environments might be in some kind of display technology in retail environments where you have a dynamic display that might change simply by logging into a different website that's locally hosted uh, that, that perhaps shows some some new uh, some new coupons or some new discounts. Um, that type of that type of application is better suited for Chrome than it might be for Android. Certainly, a lot less lightweight in that it's only navigating to a web page. But in commercial environments, outside of the Google services that the Chrome device, whether it's a Chrome box or a Chrome PC or a Chromebook might be connected to, that's, that's I think a more challenging sell, um, particularly as commercial, as commercial IT managers will have their own requirements for applications, services, service level agreements for those applications, um, the flexibility to be able to add and change things from the application layer, not necessarily digging into how those uh, how those devices um, excuse me how those applications might be either web hosted on a web page or something to that extent. So I think, in short, there are applications much more limited than if it uh, was Android. All right. Well, that's all we have time for today. So thank you, Jack, and thank you everyone for your questions. You can follow Jack and Ezra and TBR on the Twitter handles listed here, and please check out our pages on SlideShare and YouTube for our previously aired presentations. Um, uh, also, just a quick reminder, I will be following up with all of you tomorrow afternoon with the uh, slides from today's webinar, as well as the link to the recording of this presentation. And lastly, before you sign off, I'd like to ask you to take a very brief survey about today's webinar so we can uh, help improve both the information we present and how we present it for you all. Um, otherwise, thank you for attending, and have a great afternoon.